the kickoff evening um, of a new series of, of events which we are organizing from now on, lasting more or less one year and ending up in an exhibition called Watch Swain's Art and Photography, as also the series is called, also already in the publication of the show. And we will find many, many artists which we will also find on our stages in the next month. So every two months we will have a different panel discussion or lecture about different topics of surveillance. Because I think you all have these smartphones, you're all using, I guess, um, from Facebook to Instagram to Twitter, Google Maps, etc., etc. So we all, I think, um, are now more or less in this, in, in, in all this um, way of social, using social media but also um, being tracked all the time. Then, of course, video surveillance, which we all got quite used to it already. And I think you all might um, have remarked that in the last month and year, um, every morning you open the newspaper, there's another article highlighting different aspects of surveillance. So we thought this really became a very, very important topic of our society, and not only in Germany, of course, but internationally. And we thought it's very much time to start um, not only an exhibition but also a series of events highlighting different aspects. Um, we are organizing this series of events in partnership with Deutsche Welle Photography Foundation. Um, many thanks to Deutsche Welle Photography Foundation for supporting us. And um, I would love now to ask Sandra Phillips from the Center. Museum of Modern Art to the stage because of course it's your evening. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here, especially here at C 
ago where they moved a place I had known when it was a little bit further away um, in a post office and now it's this splendid place with all these wonderful people. It's a great pleasure. So let me just start by saying the SF MoMA, where I have been working, as you have heard, um, organized two exhibitions that involved examining surveillance photography. One was called Police Pictures, which opened in 1997, and the second is called Exposed, Wires of Surveillance on the Camera Since 1870, which actually opened at the Tate before it came to San Francisco. Lest you think I'm a rather strange, perhaps neurotic person by nature, I think it would be good to give you some idea of where these ex exhibitions came from, why I felt they were interesting issues, even important ones to ponder, and what the historical and critical reasons were for organizing these shows long before we, those of us who live in somewhat stable democracies were afraid of the kind of pervasive violence we face now. In 1997, there was no proven need for surveillance on anywhere the level it now enjoys. And even as late as 2010, when the surveillance show opened at the Tate, we were relatively complacent or innocent compared to the vulnerabilities we feel today. My interest in the subject of surveillance, and for me surveillance has always been aligned with voyeurism, evolved from my early introduction to photography and to the important role vernacular pictures played in understanding the medium. Let me start with the exhibition and book called The Photographer's Eye. 1963-1964. I actually did not see this show. It was both a book and a show, but I knew the book. I mean, the book was my first real guide to photography. This was the first important statement made by John Tchaikovsky. At that time, he was the newly installed director of the photography department at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. The Photographer's Eye was a radically original book, and, um, and the show was unlike any that had preceded it. It was an examination of the language of photographs, how pictures were constructed, what the tools were that photographers had to work with. It sought to disclose a tradition particular to the medium to only photography. This cover picture was used to describe the first section of the show called The Thing Itself. Sharkovsky said, quote, more convincingly than any other kind of picture, the photograph evokes a tangible presence of reality. Although this picture looks like a Walker Evans photograph, the credit to it reads, Photographer Unknown, Bedroom Interior, circa 1910, the State Historical Society of Wisconsin. In fact, and rather surprisingly, this was one of many pictures in this book and show we would call an anonymous picture. I say surprising because Tchaikovsky was almost single-handedly responsible for making photography a well-regarded, valid art of expression. It was Tchaikovsky who studied the almost unknown Eugène Achet and elevated him, for my generation at least, from a copyist to the level of great artist. It was Tchaikovsky who discovered and promoted Gary Winogrand, Diane Arbus, William Eggleston, Lee Friedlander, photographers who are now widely recognized as some 
of the great artists of their moment. Why would Tchaikovsky be particularly interested in an anonymous picture? So interested, in fact, that instead of putting a picture by Walker Evans on the cover of his first book, he put a picture by an unknown photographer on it instead, knowing that it could be mistaken for a Walker Evans picture. Tchaikovsky's predecessor was Edward Steichen, a veteran commercial photographer whose most known exhibition in his role as director of the photography department of the MoMA was The Family of Man. That show had a message that all human beings share a common aspiration and experience. Everything in The Family of Man related to or made that message clear. Not only the pictures themselves, but the way the show was designed to speak to that message. Sharkovsky's show, on the other hand, was an effort to return to the qualities that make photographs unique. Like a formalist painting analysis, the photographer's eye aspired to show what qualities photography alone possessed. Other chapters in the book include considerations of the moment or the frame. He says of this picture and others in the first section of this book, quote, our faith in the truth of photographs rests on our belief that the lens is impartial and will draw the subject as it is neither nobler nor meaner. The photographer's vision convinces us to the degree that he hides his hand. Unquote. Thus, the essence of photography is not the photographer's expression of what he or she sees, but an interpretation of what is in fact what is found in front of the camera lens. Even more than that, the essential quality of photography is its perception of truth. Quote, our belief that the lens is impartial and will draw the subject as it is. But that belief system doesn't mean that what we are presented with in photographs is true. Remember, he calls his book The Photographer's Eye. In the same book, present alongside an August Sander and an Edward Weston photograph, we also see this strange, compelling, even disturbing picture that comes from the same historical society in Wisconsin where the book's cover picture was found. The portrait of a farm woman in her black silk dress standing beside a thorny, potted plant. Somehow the woman stands and the thorns on the plant seem to complement each other. We sense that the photographer encourages us to keep our distance. Charles Van Schaik was the actual photographer. He was virtually unknown till then. But a few years later, these pictures were given an author, and in 1973, his portraits and other related pictures were selected and published in a book authored by the writer Michael Lacey and called Wisconsin Death Trip. This was actually a very important um, book for people of my generation. Lacey discovered Van Schaik's photographs in the Wisconsin Historical Society. In his book, the pictures were accompanied by excerpts from a town newspaper of the same era. 
Together, both the personal, factual reports of the tragedies of that community and the factual pictures of the people there put together made a disturbing report on the communities of ordinary people in rural, rural Wisconsin near the end of the 20th century. Ben Schick's pictures were chosen because they seem to illustrate the constraints of rural American life at that time. In other words, by choosing pictures that seem uninflected and reportorial, and juxtaposing them with actual reporting, factual words, Lisi has made a powerful, non-objective reading of these pictures in their time. My last example of the examination of vernacular photography of this period, which all of these were so important to me, was an exhibition and catalog called From the Picture Cut Press, also made by John Tchaikovsky at the Museum of Modern Art. This show was an examination of populist journalistic photography. But calling it journalistic photography really doesn't do it justice. It's not, uh, it's, it's what we would call low class um, populist journalism, um, yellow journalism, we call it. Um, and, and it's interesting because this is an examination of photography and its use in newspapers at a time when there was something called, at least in the United States, called new journalism. And um, new journalism leading people like Norman Mailer trying to make of journalism something personal because making it personal seemed to be more authentic and true. Um, in other words, this show, from the picture press, acknowledged that photographs were as much social expressions as actual reporting. The photographs of Ouija, and this is a photograph of Ouija on the cover, for instance, were in a sense ritualistic. They showed time and again that bad people murdered or captured or were captured by the police. There was certainly less interest in presenting the unusual or shocking event, event and more in describing a kind of continuity of ritual. It is also interesting to notice that Diane Arbus worked on this show. She was a researcher on it before her suicide, and one of her great discoveries, in fact, was to understand the depth and importance of Ouija. If you uh, know Barbara's work, you will know how important ritual was to her. Now to turn to my own efforts. Oh, there's the, the Ouija picture. I made this exhibition, Police Pictures, to come to terms with why Photographs from police files were so interesting. Where Sharkovsky and others saw vernacular, vernacular works as compelling in a formal way, I was also interested in understanding their history. I was interested to, to discover why these pictures, intended as documents for information, were often so emotionally compelling. In a period when photography's essential characteristics were being examined as tools for expression, I was also interested in moving beyond personal expression into what might be called the social symbolism of some of these pictures. The police photographs interested me in particular because they seem to be absolutely without personal inflection. 
documents that had no reference to any kind of personal prejudice or judgment. However, these pictures were often subtly injected with both feeling and meaning. In the 19th century, um, photography was generally believed to be impartial, and scientific photography was held to be absolutely truthful. So the study aimed to find ways in which the supposed scientific documents revealed both prejudice and fear, usually without the consciousness of the photographer. They believed that photographs told the truth. To give a few examples, and these are precedent to precedents to police photographs. In 1850, the esteemed Swiss scientist, an important figure who taught at Harvard University, was named Louis Agassiz, visited the American South and saw African slaves uh, for the first time was, and was repelled by their appearance. He talks very um, disturbingly about how disturbed he was. He commissioned the local daguerreotypist, J.T. Zeely, to make a series of daguerreotypes to study them. These pictures strangely resemble mugshots, but of course, mugshots were invented later. What is alarming is not only the strict profile and frontal view combined, but also the invasive nudity. Another esteemed scientist, Francis Galton, who was Charles Darwin's first cousin, was interested in discovering criminal types through superimposing photographs of specific kinds of degenerate individuals. His criminal composites were attempts at finding common traits and of course, they have the uncomfortable premonition of racial profiling. He also actually was interested in finding ideal types too, so he wasn't just horrible that way. My last example is Cesare Lombroso, the Italian doctor who studied epilepsy and considered it a sign of degeneracy associated with criminal behavior. He illustrated his study, Criminal Man, with pictures of epileptics. All of this is a sad reminder of the dangers of racial profiling and the rise of crime in the 19th century, along with the rise of population in the cities proletariat that lived in these newly industrialized centers, and the unsettled politics and social situations of the time, which accompany a rise in crime. Photography was made more useful when it was embraced by a statistical personality. Alphonse Bertillon, the police bureaucrat who devised the Bertillon system, felt compelled to make his analytic measurement system because of the wide, widespread fear that the communards, who had participated in this radical social experiment, um, had disappeared into the fabric of the, the country and especially in the city. They were considered dangerous criminals, but they often did not appear to be so. They looked deceptively like ordinary French people, innocent people. Bertillon's objective method, he calls it objective, was designed to rule out race, social status, and degenerate disease as markers of criminal tendencies. He created a system that was enormous and finally difficult to use, 
and it was discovered finally that even the Gartiao method was not entirely trustworthy. As um, here, uh, as measurement could be deceptive when two people were discovered to have the same appearance and measurements, one being a criminal and the other not. As a testimony of his impartial stance, <clears throat> the, the kind of symbol of his um, impartiality, he also he also invited he also formalized crime scene photography and advanced a, a viewpoint now not generally used that view from above, mimicking the eye of God. He said. So I just want to go back here, and this is um, a sort of pre-formalized um, mugshot book from, <clears throat> uh, from San Quentin Prison. And you can see what happened, of course, that, um, as you know, California was populated through the gold rush, and these are the people that the gold rush um, didn't support in some way. And they come from literally all over the world. Um, and, and so the method in this rather early form was to show the, um, the criminal with his customary hat, without his customary hat, and then in the prison uniform. And you can see his age and where he comes from um, in, in the background. Spying on the potentially dangerous was a tool of the police from the beginnings of policing. Conceded, concealed cameras were useful and very much in evidence from the time it was practical to make them until actually recently. Actually, they're still used. Um, these photographs often show social prejudice. An early San Francisco police scrapbook reveals the concealed camera surveillance of illegal Chinese opium dens in the city. Looking at these pictures, contemplating the den dangerous, give, gives those of us not pictured a sense of relief. We are not like them. We are not them. Something of the sense of release, of difference, motivated press photographers, especially one who made the first picture of an electrocution. This is not only the record of an event, but a picture of emotional <coughs> distancing. This woman is experiencing a horrific death because she committed a horrific act of murder. It was also, of course, technically difficult to make this picture besides being forbidden. The photographer concealed the camera to his um, leg, to his ankle, and, um, when, and made the exposure by lifting his trouser um, sur surreptitiously. And it was also in, in, in incredibly, enormously enlarged. As it, very tiny um, picture, actually. Oh, thank you. Sophisticated balloons. 
But effective surveillance really started with airplanes and now continues with drones. Sophisticated lenses enable police to identify protesters from a distance. I have, this is a, a picture of me actually um, by Harold Edgerton, who was very interested in uh, photographing the moment that the famous drop of milk picture was made by him. And he was called upon um, in the 40s to develop surveillance uh, technology uh, during the Second World War. So um, this was actually taken by a friend of mine who was uh, protesting the Vietnam War. It was given to him because he had he requested it um, in time for my show. Um, and 20 years later, um, in um, uh, the 90s, um, it's very interesting to see this is a picture that we included in my um, exhibition on uh, police pictures. This, this is, as you can read, this is the uh, Mexico-U.S. Uh, border with Southern California. Um, this is a, a, a looks like a very primitive picture now, with much more accurate, um, uh, hyper um, clear uh, records of these transactions now. But this was then quite new. Okay. In 2010, as you were told, 12 years after my um, initial study of photography and policing, I organized the exhibition Exposed Wires and Surveillance of the Camera Since 1870. The point of this show was to find out how extensively the idea of wireistic looking was part of the art culture of photography from the beginnings of the handheld camera and how art photography more recently involved idea, ideas of surveillance. I wanted to know the relationship of secretly made pictures for sexual betterment, as well as uh, for making art, um, art expression. Okay, so this is the cover. This is by a wonderful photographer who lives in California, Southern California, who has um, examined um, in very discreet and moving ways where people who are homeless live, or traces of homelessness, a kind of surveillance of homelessness. In any case, um, what I wanted to do was start out with really the beginnings of um, art photography that involved a kind of surveillance. And it really began with the development of the gelatin dry plate camera, which was often concealed on a person's chest and which you could uh, release by having a, a bulb in your, um, in your hand. And then the first interesting photographers to examine this were actually art photographers. Paul Strand, for instance. Um, and it's interesting, it was interesting to me to notice that these were, the, the subjects of these pictures were usually poor people. Not only Strand, and this was made with a false lens, a camera with a false lens, both of these, um, but also the Stieglitz. Um, Alfred Stieglitz's cubist picture, the this, this steerage, is a reflection of so social stratification, very common in New York at that time, an issue that Jason, Jacob Reese addressed more directly. But probably the photographer most deeply attracted to secret, the secret viewing worked a little later, and that was Walker Evans. So these pictures, both from his early work, looking down into the street from above, 
or working with uh, poor cotton farmers in the South, taking a kind of secret view of where they lived, to these pictures. The famous subway riders were entirely unaware that the bag he carried contained a camera. The number of photographs made with right angle viewfinders in the 1920s to the 40s is not known, but it was certainly widely practiced. You can see there's the photographer. Strangest of all, they seem most often to be ambiguous 
which is why contemporary artists, I think, are so interested in them. So one of the most compelling and clear um, pictures of real surveillance in our show were with these two pictures, um, a before and after picture that describes what the Russians were doing in Cuba, how they were erecting missile silos that would be directed to the United States, precipitating the so-called Cuban Missile Crisis. And what I find so interesting about this comparison here is how expressionistic the picture on the left is, how you can see um, really what's going on, how um, even in this completely anonymous picture, um, what, what seemed like this kind of delicate traced pattern on the right has become something very um, vivid and um, clearly threatening. Surveillance is usually cumulative. You have to watch something over time to see evidence of something happening, like the Russians constructing missile silos, so obvious that it can be called to account. When artists investigate our culture of surveillance, they often make ambiguous pictures that suggest, but can't exactly describe what is happening or has occurred. Andreas Magdans shows us a former listening post, a useful tool during the Cold War, but the picture only reveals the anomalous, anomalous blandness of the area, the neat fence, the graceful trees, the security apparatus that seems very modest. It seems strange rather than fearful or pretentious. Similarly, Shai Kramer's camera of a specially built city made for training Israeli soldiers and modeled on our communities in general is situated in the desert, far away from anything. There's nothing nearby, but as remarkable as how new and clearly uninhabited the strange city is spreading out far and wide into the distance. It doesn't really describe much on its own. We don't know the history that gave rise to it, except from the title. We need the title. The pictures of Trevor Paglin and Simon Norfolk both take on the technology of surveillance. They present a dilemma, beautiful pictures, until we discover the actual subject. In the relatively early Pagan picture, we see a, a pattern of vapor, a distant sort of Rothko-like atmosphere, and only when we read the caption do we realize why he made the picture. His camera was 42 miles away from the site of a proving ground for chemical and biological west weapons. Around the same time, Emily Chassier, a Palestinian artist on a residency program in Linz, used the surveillance camera to record her own interaction with the landscape of the central plots. The series is a true diary. She records herself near the fountain as the nights grow longer and the days get colder. In a way, she colonizes and personalizes the surveillance system. More disturbing and truly invasive is Sophie Cowell's project, the hotel where she was hired as a maid in a Venetian hotel and used her access to record what she found in one of the hotel rooms over a period of days, essentially spying on its occupants. Shizuko Yokomizu, um, a, a woman, a Japanese woman, is a much less invasive art, artist who examines the construct of wireless looking. She lives in London. She would walk around the streets. She contacted the residents of certain apartments she could see from the street and proposed a photograph 
that the occupants from the street at night, if they wished to be photographed, they would open their curtains at a certain time and she would make her picture without any interchange with them. If they chose not to participate in the project, they would simply close the curtains. These strange pictures describe the ambiguous contact of um, uh, and work of, of the city dweller, and more specifically from the point of view of a foreigner. As we know, and you're going to be seeing a lot of this soon, that technology and surveillance has only increased in its sophistication. Imaging technologies have become more abstract. The most recent facial recognition machines now don't even use cameras. They are kind of mapping technology made almost forensically. Because surveillance is so prevalent in contemporary society, it is present in contemporary art. A recent example is Neil Belufa's presentation at the Museum of Modern Art in New York called The Colonies. It confounds us with the mixtures of surveillance, fantasy videos, infomercials, and palpable forms that are at once inhuman and familiar, fantastic and appealing, and weirdly threatening. What seems certain is that as surveillance increases, so also does the interests artists have in considering it. I suppose there is contemporary interest in surveillance not only for its prevalence in Western culture right now, but because of its sustained ambiguity. Photographs seem essentially amb ambiguous, which is why we are often interested in looking at them. This is especially true in newspaper pic pictures, where photographs are supported by captions and contained in a text. Um, though, though they presume to represent just what is in front of the lens, photographs seem still to need the props of external information. Who took the picture? Why? What was the intent? What does the picture mean? What does it really describe? We, at least in the, the United States now, living in a moment of deep political anxiety. I would co compare these times to the anxiety felt in the late 19th century when the great cities were expanding, the society was increasingly stratified, there were many urban poor who were also considered potentially uh, threatening. Today, we have an increased migration of foreigners from far away. I'm talking about me as a, we as a, a United States citizen. Um, certainly in the United States and England at least, a desire to combat them, control them, and keep them out. The US now spends more money on surveillance of its southern border with Mexico. 90 billion dollars since 9-11 than money we spent on all other federal law enforcement agencies combined. If Donald Trump gets elected, he has promised to build a wall paid for by Mexico to keep Mexicans and other poor South Americans out. Not a single terrorist, at least not reported in the press, has been caught on the southern border. So yes, we need artists, especially because they use the tools of surveillance to be mindful, to provoke us into thinking about this new technology, which we have come to trust uncritically, and into which we have poured money that would have gone towards more useful, constructive endeavors, schools, or healthcare for the disadvantaged. There is money to be made in surveillance technology now, and no one in the U.S. is willing to stop the entrepreneurial machine. 
Only the artists can show us what we are doing and help us formulate the questions we should be asking. As with pictures included in the photographer's eye that I showed at the beginning of this talk, quote, the photographer's vision convinces us to the degree that he hides his hand. The photographers seem united in describing the strange, ambiguous, and attractive beauty of the culture of surveillance, and I hope we can pay attention to that. Thank you.
Well, the other thing is that, um, okay, so we've, we've known since 1870 that you can take pictures secretly. Um, I would also qualify it by saying that only some people realize that it, it's become gen generally acknowledged, um, maybe by 1880s, that was, that was kind of understood. Um, but voyeurism is, is, was probably even more uh, pronounced, um, certainly, uh, certainly by all these changes in society. But I think um, I think it's not a mistake that when you had people sleeping in the streets in the 1890s, the late 1900s, the 19th century, um, that people who who didn't have to sleep in the streets were taking pictures of them. So there's there's a sense of superiority or privilege that is a kind of relationship with the subject of the, the voyeur. It's also sexual voyeurism is also a privileged um, point of view. So, so and Peter Kiko's position, I mean, nobody knew he was taking those pictures. They were all sleeping. So they were all sleeping. So this is actually very, um, might be 
in danger for us. And especially in times when we all can do pictures and send them around in a second, uh, suddenly we all become voyeuristic but also observing and surveying. And um, the question is who is watching who here? And, um, Is there any other question now? Maybe does anybody have... Oh, there is one. Mm -hmm. Very thank you for your talk. It was really interesting. I, I'd like to come back to the, the question of honesty and um, to understand the, the shift of voyeurism towards civilians. Because uh, the second part of your talk, you introduced the surveillance for you as a, as a massive expansion of technology, actually. So that um, the technique um, to, to, to be able to take a, photo, a photographer from a distance right. is actually enabling uh, a new form of, um, of, uh, yeah, of, of watching, of, of, of taking photography. So, um, thinking about that, uh, I, I, I'd like to know, um, as, we, as we, as the ones that are looking at pictures done or made of civilians technology, for instance, is, uh, is it a, a way that we, we think and we are able to, to relate us to the objectives that we see with this technology? Sorry, is, if, 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 you, if, you, if you talk about this shift from, from, from Warriorism to, to technical surveillance, if you're talking about art photography done about, um, about this issue of civilians, is, you talk a lot about the relationship, the relationship as me watching a, a photographer. Do you see that this relationship, being as uh, someone watching, is shifting as well? Why we are have we are observing this shift from civilian employers to civilians? I, I don't quite understand the question. Okay. Um, does it change our way of looking at art photography while we are looking at um, civilian photography? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so what I think you're asking is, um, because we now live in a, in a society where there is a lot of surveillance, and thus a lot of ambiguous imagery floating around that we are familiar with, has it changed our idea of of art, is that right? Of art and of um, the we watching the, all those this, this techniques mm -hmm. of civilians we are familiar, familiar with um, because in our daily life it is we see all those systems of civilians and does it change our way of looking such? Um, I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. I'm sure. We are, um, well I was going to say we're less able to read black versus white. We're less able to make clear decisions. I'm not sure that that's true, but I would say that we live in a culture of, um, how shall I say, qualifications, I think. Um, at least I think so. And I think this, the, the ambiguities that we see, the, the quantities of information that we're subjected to, um, of course it has to have some effect on us, I think. I think we, we are living more complicated and less clear lives, judgmentally, I would say. 
um, it just comes also to my mind how does it change our own behavior in a way? Is it changing our own behavior if we know that somehow we are constantly watched and we never know what is done with this material? And um, this is actually um, a topic which is happening, which we will discuss next time for the next um, panel. It will be a panel discussion on the 15th of September where we will discuss the fact privacy versus street photography because street photography today you had the process of Philip Locke and Cothia in the 90s in the US mm -hmm. and we recently had a similar process here in Germany. Um, so suddenly you realize that the fact to know that you are constantly watched and you don't know you don't have any control anymore. I think it also changes a lot your behavior and how you see photographs and how you take care of keeping control in a way. Well, it's, but it's interesting that in the United States, the reason that that the Philip Lorca de Corsia picture was not so so powerful that it changed the law was because there was a tradition of this wires to photography. So, so that, that was appreciated by artists. I mean, I remember my friend Peter Galassi going to the trial and saying there is this tradition that started in the 19th century and, and there are many important artists that we have hanging in the walls of our museum from Robert Evans to Robert Frank, et cetera, et cetera. Who, whose work was taken without the knowledge of the subject. You cannot, you cannot control that, you cannot say that that's a good goal. So it's a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. So what was decided here? <laughs> it's still in process. Yeah. And uh, the fact which is now coming in addition is that now it's digital photography. So the, the argumentation was that these photographs are done very much more quicker uh, and that you don't really choose um, the angle you need, etc. But you just shoot and then you make the selection afterwards. So they said this is, has nothing to do anymore with art. So it, it's a complete different situation and I don't want to tell too much because I want to keep you yes. uh, material <laughs> for the next <laughs> time. But if there are any questions anymore, last chance now. <laughs> And I would like to thank you all for having been here. Thank you so much, Sandra, for your lecture and having been here. And um, we are still here in the room, so if there are questions, you can still come to Sandra and we can discuss it in a smaller round. Um, no worries about that. And I would love to invite you to the next um, event, which will be the panel discussion called Privacy versus Street Photography on 15th of September here at Silver here in this space. <laughs> Thank you very much. You will find outside, when you go outside, and if you are interested in the topic of surveillance, um, a large selection of books of any kind, art books, but also more scientific books um, approaching this topic, and which we will find the whole next month also in our bookstore, accompanying this event, and then also our exhibition, which will be held in spring 2017. Thank you so much to all of you.